right. It is. We're, all right. We are in re record mode and it will be emailed to you after um this webinar so that you can share it with your colleagues um we're also going to do a little write-up in the review my ms blog next week and we will put a link to the recording there so you can dig for the key takeaways in the recording or feel free to harass me or peter or peggy anytime and we'll be we'll get it over to you and of course as i mentioned if you find today's webinar helpful please feel free to share it with your colleagues we fully expect your wheels to be turning and we're going to have lots of questions for Peter and Peggy. So ask the way they are actually prepared to answer your questions as they unlock all of this good information. So as these questions come to your mind, go ahead and use the chat channel that many of you are already using there that chat panel to ask your questions. And if it applies to the conversation immediately, Peggy and Peter are gonna jump in and answer your, your question right then and there. If for some reason they miss it or um, we're already on to the next section, we'll wait to the end to answer your question, but feel free to go ahead and just pose those questions right there in the chat panel and we will make sure we get to all of them. So now let's get down to today's business. For that, I'm going to introduce you to my wonderful friends and i apologize i don't have your bio pulled up in front of me i can't believe i did that i've never done that before so here we go um to my wonderful friends um peter and peggy peggy hoffman and peter Housel. i think i said that correctly you'll have to correct me if i'm wrong there peter our partners in mariner management peggy entered the association field through pr and communications directly from college Peter spent his early career on the road as a musician. Ooh, we want to hear more about that. Before settling into an association role as number two for a trade association. I'm sure he'll explain all the details and the connection there. Um, and Peggy and Peter will fill in all the wonderful details about how they are here talking about awesome chapter management, chapter engagement. Take it away, Peggy and Peter. There we go. Awesome. Thank you so much. It is uh, fun to be here, um, needless to say. Listen, we have the chat open. So as Terry's already mentioned, please use the chat for comments, for out of girls, out of boys, or no way, I don't believe that, or questions. Um, this is going to be a chat. we got a really um, nice group here, so there should be plenty of space in the chat and plenty of space in the airwaves for us to have a chat. What brings us here today is um, in part, I mean, the, the study that we're going to be talking about is pre-pandemic, but the reality is, is things have changed so amazingly. And we know that um, according to the ASAE research, and I don't know if you are a member of ASAE or, or are plugged into their um, COVID-19 ongoing research, but more than 50% of associations have already reported disruption in existing member programs, events, and activities, and suffering with how in the world do we be able to meet folks. 40% said they don't see any in-person events between, before um, 2021. I was talking with someone the other day, and it may be 22 before we really get back into any kind of a rhythm on that. So while this, none of this has projections on um, really on member retention, um, I would say that the first two data points really are making all of us just a bit uh, skittish, a little bit fearful. Um, after all, um, we truly understand that engagement is the is the glue that assures retention and, of course, also drives acquisition. So uh, let's uh, let's leave the bad news because the neat thing is is that we've got some. Um, some really cool data and some really beautiful little inklings of some of some opportunities that we're seeing associations uh, pull together. In fact, the data is, as I said, it's pre-pandemic, and it was already showing this kind of shift or a little bit of a tiny, we don't want to use the word pivot, but a little bit of a pivot towards looking at chapters as true engagement, um, as true engagement channels. In fact, 64% of the respondents in the, in the 2019 um, chapter benchmarking report 
indicated that um, member engagement was an absolutely essential role for their chapters. So um, it makes sense, right? Local is a hot way to pull in folks, particularly an entry for new careerist students. Um, but it's also a place where we find that those who've been around for a while can give back because they like to plug in to students in early careers. So anyway, let's go ahead and explore all that. Um, I want to sort of give you a quick little background on what's going on here. So as Terry's mentioned, uh, Peter and I are um, with Mariner Management. It's a, a company, an AMC, small virtual AMC, and a consultancy that opened its doors back in 2002. Um, our mission at that point was to provide an administrative support, a strategic support for chapters. And m all three of our organizations that we manage are local or or chapters of another organization. One has um, there's a there's a very um, and this is what's cool about how we can bring this in. One is a very very distant relationship. Two are tied very tight. So we understand this dynamic coming from a bunch of different perspectives. Um, we've done the benchmarking report. We've sponsored it now for um, two years, um, and so we're going to share some of comparison data here. But this past year wouldn't have been possible if it had not been for our incredible partners over at Bill Highway. So I like to be able to just do a quick shout out to them. They helped us in um, working with Kevin Orton from Orton. Um, um, uh, marketing and research um, helped us create the report. Did a lot of some of the of the work and having these really good conversations. Now Mariner and Bill Highway can um, uh, partner and collaborate on a couple of things, including the only conference for chapter-based organizations. So if you're interested in, in having a whole day of looking at this, you'll have to check out the um, CEX Component Exchange, which is coming coming in uh, in October. Um, but my, I give you by way of this to show you that we've done a lot of work on the chapter experience so we can take um, this conversation and we can go in a lot of different directions. So use your chat to be able to ask us the questions that help us get to the end of this. The way we've laid this, um, this very quick hour out is we want to start with a view of how associations um, look at chapters. Um, it, this comes from the benchmarking, obviously, study. And then dive into some examples of how associations are tapping into their chapters as this incredible member engagement opportunity. And really a member acquisition and retention opportunity as well. All those are tied together. And finally, uh, kind of wrap it up with some thoughts on supporting the chapters. And the reason why we want to come back to the support on supporting the chapters, none of this happens unless there's a little bit of, of support and activity. We'll talk a little bit about that. We have five things we'd like to share with you on the end on that. What I'd like to do is get a little bit of a sense of the small group that we have here. Like, um, you know, tell me a little bit about you. What is your primary role in the organization? Are you membership focused? Maybe you have a full chapter focus. Maybe it's uh, communications, PR, um, meetings, events, um, advocacy, GR, IT, executive team. You may have more than one. That's why I put the word primary in there. So just um, give us a sense of the part of the, the part of the organization that you hail from that you have your most um, most alignment with. So I see we've got people coming in. Give almost popcorn. So we always wait just to hear to the last couple of things. So what I'm seeing so far, and I'm going to ask Peter to wrap it up in about 10 seconds. There we go. Most of you look at your primary role is membership, um, which we happen to think is important. Um, so love seeing that. Got some executive teams, some IT, some communications, and some chapters. One of the things that um, you'll hear us say is that one of the biggest um, uh, mm, not to do's <laughs> is to think of chapters as a silo, whether they are separately incorporated or wholly owned by the organization. This notion of bringing all of the teams together to be to leverage this channel is going to be really powerful stuff for us. So let me also find out um, a little bit about what is your whoops I'm going to get um Peter, to do that, right. What are, best describes the chapters in your organization? So I'm presuming most of you have chapters, but I do have a don't have chapters option. Um, and maybe you have, sometimes you have like a, we noticed in the benchmarking, more and more people are having 
a hybrid approach, so feel free to use the other. But if you use the other, do me a favor and tell us in chat what you mean by that. So if you're struggling a little bit with this, separately incorporated in charters mean they're really independent organizations, but they operate because you have a charter with them. They would not operate alone, whereas an independent affiliate could operate with or without you. Wholly owned subsidiaries mean they're not separately incorporated. Um, they are, you know, they're an extension of your organization. Federation is, of course, a bottom-up kind of environment. Um, and then um, uh, sometimes people will look at, well, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of, we're, we're all of our, uh, some of our wholly owned are incorporated, or they might say, well, not all of our chapters are incorporated. Um, so whatever works for you. All right. Peter's now sharing the poll, and we have about a third of you are separately incorporated. A number of you have independent affiliates. We've got uh, a couple of you with wholly owned, and a couple of you don't have chapters, and that's awesome. So if you don't have chapters, um, go ahead and put in the chat um, what brings you here then. I'm just curious. Um, I know we had a webinar not long ago, and the reason why um, they were here was, quite frankly, it was pretty awesome. They were thinking about having chapters. So. Um, what I'd love to do now is, is have Peter uh, take over the screen because I'm going to ask him as the data grew. I'm the colors and shapes. He's, the, he's the, um, the numbers guy. Have him walk us through some of the highlights of the benchmarking. Peter? I can't hear you, Peter. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. I was just taking a nap. I'm sorry. It's Tuesday and it's nap time. What can I say? Uh, so first of all, I was, in fact, a musician, and I had hair down to here. Uh, and then I sold my soul, got an MBA, and started working for associations. And uh, then I was CEO of a national trade association that had chapters, and I hated them all. And I wanted to be part of the don't have chapters group. <laughs> but uh, since we started Mariner and got a chance to see the world from a variety of sides, including, including sides where chapters could be a, a real viable, serious contribution to the member value proposition, uh, that's where I began to realize that, yes, there is something that, that's worth looking at here. And so that's when, when we started looking at this notion of benchmarking. And, and oftentimes we look at the, the, the benchmarking as a concept that allows us to look at the past to predict the future, when in fact what we really should be doing is thinking about how we can look at the past to design the future. How can we make the future better than it is today? Uh, and there are a lot of different reasons why uh, people benchmark. So maybe if, if we could take a few minutes and, and in the chat box just share what do you look for when, when you're benchmarking. Uh, there, there are a lot of things, a lot of reasons why why people do benchmarking, and we did our our benchmarking study back in, in tw last one in 2019, and I think we had 177 associations participating in the in the study, uh, and, and so that gave us a pretty good sense, and it was pretty good diversity with respect to both. Uh, Federation, and, uh, uh, professional societies, trade associations, et cetera, all the different structures in terms of the organization itself as well as, as chapters with uh, organizations with holding their own subsidiaries versus uh, totally independent uh, like the federation structure. So we had a good mix there. And, and when people were trying to benchmark, they were looking at a number of things. You know, how, do, how do our programs compare to those of other associations? Uh, what are standard practices regarding uh, membership and programming and, and and requirements and compliance and metrics and things like that. Um, what support services do do uh, we offer to our chapters? And this is really an important resource allocation question that all associations are trying to get their arms around because it costs money. And today, especially, uh, it, associations are. are <laughs> really working hard to figure out how can we make the most of the very limited dollars available to us. Um, and, and then last but not least, uh, you know, how do we assess performance and the value of our chapters? And most importantly, you know, how are our, ch are our chapters still relevant? And, and the COVID crisis has in many respects really laid bare any, any of the fractures, any of the seams, any of the, the weaknesses in our structures as an organization and, and have made us begin to question things we hadn't questioned before. So when we look at this question of, of you know, why do we benchmark, um, I don't necessarily suggest we look at benchmark to see how we can be like everybody else. I look at benchmarking as an opportunity to see how we're different 
and how we're the same. And we can look at how we're different and say, is that a good reason to be different? Is, that, is our difference something that is defining for us that makes sense in our, in our system? And where we're the same, is this something about which we want to be the same? So it's, it's more a matter of helping us take through that introspection that allows us to better ascertain whether or not we're allocating our very limited resources more effectively uh, or as, as effectively as we can. So we measured a lot of things when we did this, this analysis. Uh, we looked at the inputs, you know, how do we, uh, how do we operate? Um, we looked at the activities, what do the chapters do? And there are lots of questions around the, the organizational structure. Only one question about the activities, but it was a big question with lots of what are the things that, that your chapters do? We also began to look at outcomes. Um, and we looked at membership, who they serve. We had a few questions around that. We looked at performance, how well they do it. However, the, the difficulty with the performance question is that people have generally what I would call sort of soft qualitative evaluations of the performance of their chapters. Very rarely do we see any hard objective numbers around the performance of the, of the chapters. And, and you'll, you'll find that Peggy and I argue pretty vehemently and strongly on a regular basis that we need to look hard at ROI. Uh, I, will, I, I can't help tell you how many times I've, I've sat in front of a CEO and said, well, it looks to me like you're spending, let's say, three, three quarters of a million dollars on chapter support. So what's on the income side of your P&L that justifies that three quarters of a million dollars? And, and, and that, that's where you begin to make people uncomfortable. And, but I would say you, know, you need to have a good answer to that because maybe you shouldn't be spending three quarters of a million dollars. Maybe you should only be spending $250,000. Or on the flip side, maybe we should be spending a million dollars. But until you do that analysis and we have a, an ROI process that we can use to really put some numbers behind that to, to help us have a good – justifiable uh, business rationale that you could go to the CFO and say, this is why we're spending this much money and this is what is, what is the return to us. But until you've done that kind of work, it's really hard to tell, you know, is it work that's worth doing? So the, the, the other place that we always struggle when we think about our chapters is, is how do they fit into the mission overall? How do they complete the value proposition for our members. Because our members don't draw the lines that we do. They don't say, well, here are the chapters over here, and here's the National Association over here. They look at this as one large organization. And so it's really important, and, and we saw that in, our, in our, some of our responses, it's really important that members view the chapters and the national organization as a coherent, cohesive whole that's operating collaboratively and really trying to, to bring a, a good, consistent member value proposition wherever they happen to be. And when the chapters operate in silos and when they're separated from, when, when you hear this us and them kind of stuff, that's when, when things get really messy with respect to how well we, we make our chapters a part of our big ecosystem. So mission is, is really critical. And Again, if, if you're herding cats, if you feel like you're herding cats, that's because there isn't a shared mission. There isn't a shared vision with the chapters, and, and that's what needs to be focused on from an organizational perspective. So question, uh, which of the data points that we've talked about do you track? And there are lots of data points that we could be looking at. Um, and, and if you would, in the chat box, just sort of tell us when you look at your chapters, uh, or for those of you who don't have chapters, if you were to look at chapters, <laughs> What data points would you want to, to get your arms around? And in our analysis, and we've done this a couple of times now, uh, we typically found, and this is not a comprehensive list, but these were the, the areas where the majority of the focus tended to, to sit. Uh, people were looking at retention, recruitment, participation, satisfaction, event evaluations. The shift that we have seen, and you can see this right at the top, is this, this emphasis now on retention. and, and shifting from 41% as a key metric in 2016 to 71% in 2019. That's a 30% increase. And recruitment went up. So this whole notion of, of membership and participation and satisfaction, really member engagement has become a far more critical role for chapters in an association's ecosystem. Member engagement has become a far more critical role for chapters in a member's a membership ecosystem. And I think, again, that's where people are finally beginning to realize that we need to look at this as a coherent whole, not as, as separate entities out there trying to serve the members in different ways. So we see those, those jumps that have happened between 26 and 2019. Um, in terms of what chapters do, no surprises here, right? They, they do local network, networking activities. They have 
meetings and events, they have their own chapter developed programming. Um, they do some public uh, service and charity programs. Uh, they design, the, in many cases, 91% design their own professional development programs and increased from 68% in 2016. So why is this important? Well, well, part of the importance here lies in why do we have chapters in the first place? What is the local conversation that is uniquely different from the national conversation? And this is where chapters as a geographic entity have a valid, potentially a valid purpose. Uh, and so you want to ask yourself, what is the difference between the conversation I might have in Maryland versus in Minnesota versus in Missouri versus in California? And, and why is that conversation different? And how can I make sure that the members, wherever they are, are getting the information they need to be successful in their location? Yes, there are certainly a lot of national issues that we want them to be aware of, but sometimes the people in Maryland really don't care what's going on in Minnesota or, or Missouri. They want to know about what's happening in Maryland. One of the groups that we manage is the Maryland Recycling Network. Uh, recycling is a decidedly uh, regional, actually local uh, activity. It's governed by typically state and, and, and county uh, rules. It's, there is no national <laughs> system here. Uh, so, so local entities are really important. There are other organizations for which the local conversation may not be as important, but there is still an importance to, and again, this is where as human beings, uh, social animals, we want to get together with other people and, and be next to them. So part of what chapters do is create this place where people can actually get next to each other and, and, and share. Now, Obviously, COVID has raised some questions about this getting next to each other and sharing part, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but still this notion of a local conversation is really important to keep in mind as we go forward. So one of the other areas that we explore in our, in our benchmarking, and this is also, again, a place that's very important for us to look at and for each of you who have chapters to consider as well when you try to determine what's the value that chapters are bringing to the table. Uh, we do what we call an importance and effectiveness gap analysis. And we'll ask a question, for example, how important is member engagement to you? And they'll scale that on a one to five scale. And then we'll say, how effective are your chapters at delivering member engagement? And again, they'll rate that on a scale of, of one to five, and we compare the difference, and that, that gives us the gap. So as you can see, between, whoops, between 2016 and 2019, member engagement increased in importance from 3.4 to 4.5 on the five-point scale, and the effectiveness increased as well, but not nearly as much, and so the gap actually grew from minus 1.2 to minus 1.8. So associations had greater expectations of their chapters around member engagement, and they had lower, a lower sense of the value that chapters were bringing to that conversation. So that sort of begs the question, is that something we can fix? Is that something we should fix? And is that something we have the resources to fix? Because you really need to figure out the answers to all three of those questions to determine how you move forward. Uh, you can see in the other areas that there were certainly some increases in importance for leadership development, member recruitment, professional development. Uh, and again, we saw uh, variations in the gap. Uh, the only one that did not increase was the gap between uh, perform professional development importance and effectiveness. So <clears throat> again, we want to make sure that our chapters are doing the right thing. We don't want to be hurting cats. A clear, well-defined vision and shared mission are critical to, to helping our chapters be the best that they can be. So question now, what role do your chapters play for your association? And again, let's, let's try this po post in the chat what you think are the key activities, the key functions. How, how do the, your chapters round out the value proposition that your member, your, your organization delivers to its membership. And one of the, the arguments that we often have with organizations is, is how, and I shouldn't say argument, this discussion we have <laughs> with organizations is how do we help the chapters realize they should not be mini-me's. They're not mini versions of the national organization. They have a clear role, but it's not to be uh, a local version of the national organization, they need to think about how they can be a complement to the national organization. And vice versa, how does the national organization answer that exact same question? How does the national organization step back from this, this notion of we have to be everything to everybody and instead say, how can we leverage the, the, the partnership, the, the collaboration, the, the symbiosis of our chapter system to really 
give our members a good rounded out um, uh, value proposition. So I'm looking to see, are we seeing any interesting ideas in our chat there, Peggy? Yeah, Anything that, I think you might be muted. Yeah, so um, I, I love that um, <laughs> David, and, and being someone who enjoys her wine, I was working with the Wine Education Organization and said until they can figure out how to send wine over the Internet or out of our USB port. Hmm, that's an interesting idea. <laughs> I guess it will be integral. <laughs> uh, so, yes. Yeah, so, um, and I, I, David, I am equally interested in that uh, because – if, well, actually, there was a, a technology guy I heard uh, a few years ago, and he said, tactile is just a matter of bandwidth, right? Tactile is just a matter of bandwidth. And if tactile is just a matter of bandwidth, then taste is just a matter of bandwidth, right? So maybe this fuzzy notion about having wine over the Internet isn't so fuzzy after all. <laughs> so, so moving along, then, uh, one of the things that we study in the benchmarking report is – what are the issues that organizations struggle with when they come with it, or what are they concerned about when, they, when they're working with their chapters? And again, we saw a shift between 2016 and 2019, and that being that quality control became much more important to everyone. And when we think about what member engagement, member engagement is quality control is central to member engagement. We want the member experience, wherever they are, however they touch our organization, to be positive. And if, in fact, members are having uneven experiences across our chapter system, that's a quality control problem. Uh, obviously, alignment is important as well, but you know, this, is, this is key to us really understanding how organizations are addressing these, these issues. So, excuse me, I'm, there we go. And last but not least, uh, we asked people if they calculate ROI. And I mentioned ROI before. This is a process that we like to run people through where they actually put some numbers on the value of chapters, and still only a handful are actually doing that. And I think that's a place where, where I currently see of an organization with chapters, I'd be saying, absolutely got to do this. And only about a third have a formal tracking tool to assess chapter performance. And that tracking tool typically f focuses on things like member retention and member recruitment. Uh, occasionally on other areas, but doesn't look broadly at member engagement. So, one of the biggest concerns we often ran into. Was so, that, um, Peter, just to real uh, quickly, um, I'm getting okay. some um, the 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 um, audio on your your phone. We got a little weird there. I don't know if I'm the only one that heard it or not, but um, okay. Anybody in chat want to indicate whether or not? Um, Yes, the audio is crazy here too. Let's see. Is it uh, Brenda? Is it is it um, crazy on um, both of our sides, or is it just Peter? We. <laughs> I know I need a haircut, so that could be part of the problem. Okay. Okay. So let me go ahead. Um, apparently, for whatever reason, everyone's saying it's it's something to do with your phone. So. Um, okay. What I'm going to do real quickly is dial in, dial out, no, dial back in. You're better now. You're better. And you're better now. You're better go now. For it. I'm better now. Okay. And let me adjust my microphone. Is that better? Are we good? Better now? Okay. Glad to hear. What was I talking about? I don't know. Um, so uh, as, as I noted before, members typically do not differentiate between the national organization and the chapter. And so we want to be really careful that we don't make that distinction internally. We want to find a way to view these as a, a cohesive entity. And, and so part of the struggle that we have when we look at our chapters, we, we're trying to figure out what their role is, and you're looking at this chart and going, what does this have to do with anything? <laughs> well, it is kind of lots of words and stuff, and I'm going, hmm. So this is some research that was done by community brands looking at uh, the difference in how people relate to associations over their lifetime, or I should say over their career. And we've seen lots of conversations around generational differences, but what we usually find tracks more closely to how people engage with organizations is not their generation, but where they are in their life cycle. And so as you can see, what they identified here were what are the issues and the concerns and, and the needs that 
people have at different stages of their career. So the earlier career person, as you might expect, is really looking for training first and foremost. Uh, they want to get, they, they want to figure out where are the jobs, where the, what's going on in the industry, how can I grow myself professionally? And as they mature, uh, oh, maybe that's not the right word, as they get older, as they move along, uh, then they start looking for other things from an organization. So that in the late career, they're looking for, for example, ethics. Uh, and I'm still looking for ethics. I used to have scruples, and then I got an MBA, and I lost them all. So what can I say? But at any rate, th there's obviously a shift in how people interact with the organization. And this is really important when you think about the role that a chapter can play. And that would be because when we think about the kinds of things that early careerists want, and we're trying to get early careerists into our organizations, chapters are perfectly positioned to make that touch for us. Because early career people usually don't have the bucks to go flying off to a national conference. Uh, national conference. They usually don't have the wherewithal and the time to, to walk away from their job long enough to participate in that way. Whereas they can get really l relatively low cost but high value inter interactions with the organization through their local chapters, through local meetings and events. And while that may seem kind of strange to talk about in the current era of this social distancing, we know that that eventually is going to go away. We're going to get, we may not get back to where things were before, but I'm pretty sure we'll get back to 80 or 90 percent of where we were before. People, we are social animals. We want to get around the campfire, tell stories, you know, share jokes, all those kinds of things. And the chapter can be a, an ideal channel through which to, to make that happen. So that's where we want to think about what's the role the chapter can play for us, and this may be a key area for them to deliver some significant value to the organization. But again, they need to understand how they fit, what their role is, and, and they need to be resourced in a way to, to make that happen. So like I said before, this, this notion of networking and socializing and finding job, or job opportunities are critical for, to the early careerists so we can build upon them and the older folks like me uh, are looking for ethics and industry information and, and representing interests. So by tapping the chapters as a, as a member, membership channel, you can reach some new audiences, right? Not just the, the younger members, but you can touch the non-members, the local only members, and, and other folks in different ways. Interestingly, one of the upsides of this little adventure we're having with social distancing uh, and, and the conversion to virtual is that there are more and more chapters are offering virtual programming and discovering folks showing up at their virtual programming whom they had never ever seen before. Not only folks who are inside their geographic space, but folks who are outside their geographic space. So I think it's really important to realize that for lots of chapters, their universe has limited, been limited typically by the car. And what we've seen is awakening now that there are other ways to, to reach people. Um, Obviously, you can capture the local story, the local angle, all the local, uniquely local elements of whatever your organization is all about can be captured inside of a chapter. And they create a sense of community. Uh, uh, ultimately, I think all of us are looking for some for, for relationships, and we're looking for affirmation. And I think those are so, so critically important elements of the association experience that chapters are uniquely positioned to provide. And they can obviously you know, help your organization grow. So one of the things that we always talk about with our chapters is how can they be the best possible education partner? And there are different organizations that approach this in different ways. Uh, interestingly, the National Association of Tax, uh, Tax Professionals did some analysis, and I love this. This is, this is the greatest example of evidence-based decision making. They took a look at the experience, the, the numbers around chapter delivered education versus national delivered education. And they found that their retention numbers correlated very strongly with the number of programs offered by their chapters, and not at all with the number of programs offered by the national organization. Uh, and, and so that was a place where they said, hmm, there's a thing here that we need to pay attention to. Not exactly sure what it's all about, but we do see there's a strong correlation there between retention and, and locally delivered training. Uh, the Associated General Contractors did a wonderful uh, pivot, as, as it were, to expand the member value for their members. Uh, and, and a great example would be the Austin chapter ran a training program, and it was, it was, it was $1,500 for non-members and about 1295, 12, $1,295 for members. Uh, four days over four months, one day 
or four days over four weeks, I'm sorry, one day each week. They sold out. They sold out on a $1,295 virtual class. That was a training program. But interestingly, not only did they sell out, but they also had members from outside of their geographic space who participated. And they did a nice thing. They said, we're going to get every chapter who's one of, who's one of, whose members attended, we're going to give them a $300 rebate. So they, they really did a great thing in terms of delivering value to the membership. But more importantly, they also delivered value to the system. They, they told their chapter peers, hey, we're all in this together. And that's really important. And then, of course, um, there's another. Yes. So the uh, – Metro DC chapter of the Appraisal Institute has really said, hmm, there are lots of national issues, and, but that's not really where we're going to spend our time and energy because appraisal is both a national con conversation. There's the Appraisal Qualifications Board that sets some national standards, but real estate, which is what appraisal is all about, is fundamentally a local, 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 local conversation. So we have built the programming for AIDC around local appraisal issues, and that's given them a way to really build out the overall value of the appraisal institute to the appraisal population as a whole. So those are the key ways in which uh, they can be, the chapters can be education partners, as an example. And so we invite you to explore as many of them as you can as well. And so I think if I've got this right, Peggy is going to talk about tapping chapters as recruiters. Yes, I am. So, one of the things we wanted to do in today's uh, yes, one of the things we wanted to do in today's um, webinar was to give you lots of ways that illustrated from the uh, research on how you could actually tap chapters. And so we wanted to give you these six ways. Peter's talked about perhaps one of the most vibrant ways right now, and maybe not just even right now, but moving forward, particularly as we move out of the pandemic, but we're not quite out of the pandemic, so we need to have those smaller events. I think the really cool second way is all about um, tapping them as recruiters, and I mean for membership. I mean one of the things that we oftentimes um, need to do is look for some really good word-of-mouth channels. And in fact, that's what we found when we did our story search. So let's start a little bit with the um, Home Builders Association. They did a upping the recruitment game in which they did a, um, a uh, contest for their chapters, organizations, to be able to talk about um, the membership. What I think is really cool is that the Maryland one did their annual drive, right? And here's what they got. They got 35 members were actively recruiting, 18 of which brought in a new member, and they had one of their best years ever. Now, I will tell you that there was, and I love this idea, take this one home to steal it, a package of prizes for those who um, recruited new members included luxury add-ons to their International Builder Show in Vegas that February. Okay, So in other words, you were earning some experiential elements in return for selling the membership. I love what the um, American um, Optometric Society did because they sort of married this idea of how do we figure out how to bring in the next gen with a beta test. So they weren't going all out on how, do they, how they develop a new channel, but they tested it in a couple of geographic areas. So, so when they did this, they called it the United in Possibilities. It actually won a 2019 ASAE Gold Circle Award. That's how good it was. It yielded a conversion rate of 11%, exceeding their 8% their 8% project goal. Um, now, what I loved about this one is really about it was really about applying or, or activating the the digital um, the the, um, the digital aspects of of a, um, of a of a marketing campaign. So they could have only done it using the power of their digital tools with the power of that local grassroots support. Then you have IMA. So IMA is the Institute of Management Accountants, and um, they actually managed to hit their 100,000 milestone in their membership acquisition by what? By tapping chapters specifically chapters in, in global areas. It's really hard to reach out and build be sometimes beyond your own borders, but by 
being able to use those chapters as kind of in-country support, right, they were able to actually um, optimize and, and boost their recruitment. And finally, um, ISC Squared, they did a really cool thing where they said, let's target some students and new careerists. And using their chapters, they created two different opportunities for a networking and for a and for a um, and for an educational program. But they did this incredible blend of technology and in person so that they could really capture the interest and the excitement on the parts of their um, students and early careerists. So in each of these cases, you've got an example of how an organization has been able to increase membership, which brings us to number three, because oftentimes that increase of membership is because of service delivery, right? And I love, love, love what some of the stories about how folks have done this. I'm going to start off, though, with the Military Offers Association of America because they did this incredible um, uh, program to deliver direct assistance to military families and local communities using their chapters and their foundation, created some grant programs, and really showed how they could, they could serve members at the very heart of where they, they needed that service. Now, RAPS, one of their chapters, an amazing little chapter out of, out of, out of um, the New York, New Jersey area, piloted a speed mentoring program. They just took mentoring to a different level. And the reason why it worked is you were in a room with people that were in your community, and you got a chance to meet people and get some really powerful advice. Now, taking that a little bit broader was the ends of court. Their Mid-Atlantic chapter did a professional matchmaking um, um, program in which they – which it was both in person, but it exuded beyond that. So there's two different kinds of mentoring, but all three of those cases are places where the chapters were uniquely able to deliver the value. I want to talk just a moment about a couple of others who put a twist on an event that created that, that beautiful face-to-face -face that went along with, and I think this is important, we do these incredible member onboarding programs, right, and these credible member welcome programs. But when you can put a face-to-face, -face, NARI, their um, Kansas City chapter does an amazing new member mingle that fills the room and gives people that very personal I'm going to meet somebody that's a peer. Um, I'm showing you also a picture of the PRSA Coffee With because these are small eight to ten people gatherings in which we bring folks together to um, have really focused conversations around a question or two. You couldn't do that. You couldn't do that financially. You couldn't do that programmatically except that at the chapter level you can. So you're delivering that unique member experience. If now, I can add a quick little yeah. comment to that, I think that's really important to keep in mind is we tend to validate events around the number, and we're always looking for a big number. And I think we miss the point that for a lot of members, a small number can be as if not more valuable than a big number, particularly depending upon the kind of person. Just being with a small group is much more comfortable to them. But I think taking this notion away that we have to have 100 people in order to have success is really important to help our chapters understand. And having a meeting with five people can be a great meeting. Right. And, it's, and again, I love Peter. Thank you for, um, for, bringing that, uh, for highlighting that because really the, the point here is that it's not something we can do nationally, but we can certainly do it locally. And speaking of that connection to local, I love number four, partners in public outreach, starting with ASLA. Now, what's really wonderful about this is they have a World um, Landscape Architecture Month. Um, you're seeing um, on the uh, full, far right side two examples. They did this amazing Instagram campaign in which they had chapters take over their Instagram account for a week, for a day at a time, I think the day, way or week at a time, and allow them to highlight member properties on the national. Instagram account. They grew the Instagram account amazingly, but imagine that incredible affirmation, that incredible affirmation of having your project on a national thing. Yes. Now, staying in that kind of virtual-like movement, I love what the um, Nurses Association did with Fit 
Nurse Friday. It started really as a social media campaign. They wanted to really promote um, healthy lifestyles, particularly for nurses, and a cross-departmental. Remember I said at the beginning how good important it is not to be a silo for the chapters? A cross-departmental team got together and said, how can we make this even more powerful? Enter chapters. They wound up doing a um, fitness by participating in a 5K on your own or virtually, um, and they were able to not only build excitement about this, right, they were able to get the word out on lots of different social media platforms and made a huge difference in the Healthy Nurse, Healthy Nation. They reached over 4.5 million people on Facebook and Twitter, and that was because they brought their states in. I love David. You said you Instagram and takeovers too. Um, yeah, and I think there's another opportunity. Throwback Thursday on Instagram, by the way, is another way of dealing with that because it's it is it is during COVID. And it's kind of hard to get out there. Now, five of the buzz creators. Now, yeah, it's a little bit the same of what I've just was just talking about. But this first buzz creator is something that really can help your national organization. So the Association of Change Management Professionals did this whole road to the conference challenge. They wanted to create a buzz around their conference to get more people there. Now, this was pre-COVID, but now think about this application to virtual because I think it has a great way to just leverage this. Anyway, it was a weekly trivia game, right? For members, it was over a three-month period of time. Um, they profiled a, 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 an ACMP chapter with a, sh with a link to a short quiz, and at the chapters, of course, promoted when theirs came up, right, and the conference, and there was a prize for the conference registration, regist person who registered, and, um, and a, little, a little bonus for the chapter. So if you want to get your chapters really involved in helping you fill your national virtual or in-person event, having some kind of a marketing tie-in with the chapters made a huge difference for this group. So um, what I loved about it, I was just looking for that. I don't see that. I, I had the numbers down there. Um, ask me offline, and I'll be glad to tell you a, a little bit more about those numbers. Now, going back to the um, – the um, Institute of Management Accounting. I want to bring them back in here because they did a you got to earn it. Again, ACMP was trying to promote conferences. They are trying to promote their certification. Yeah, they reached 500,000 people via Facebook on a video contest that they drove through the, through the um, chapter system. What I really loved is that they were trying to reach millennials, and they succeeded. So they received um, dozens and dozens of, of submissions, and um, the big thing was all the social media outreach that happened. So your chapters can really help you create that incredible buzz. Now, sometimes we underestimate, and I think now more than ever with COVID and all these other things that are going on, it's really critical that we find new ways to look at old problems or we find new ways of delivering. And one of the cool things about chapters is that they can be real incubator hubs if, if we do a couple of things, including encouraging them, supporting them, um, but also celebrating when they've done this. Let me give you an example of a couple of things that were definitely worth celebrating. So the CFA Institute's um, one of their, college, their um, societies in New York a number of years ago really was looking for a different way to create outreach in, to college students and to get beyond their own membership base. So one of the things that they did was they aimed at the, at the university community a research challenge in which the students would, be, would have to search, research a publicly traded company and then make recommendations on buy, sell, or hold. So CFA is a certified financial advisor. And so what they were doing was teaching them in a real-life scenario how to be the most effective they could be. But at the same time, creating this wonderful challenge. Well, the, the dynamic was so great that um, – so great, and not only college students, but bringing in young members – that it then became uh, a, a templated program, and now it is offered by over 100 schools, and there is a global competition to go with it. So you see, by 
encouraging innovation at the chapter level and watching it and then nurturing it by helping, by giving ideas, by giving some support dollars, they were able to build it. Now, one of the things about CFA Institute, for example, is rather than just giving money out, they do grant programs. So their PR uh, department has a grant program, um, their education department has a program, grant program. So think about how do I support and finance my, uh, my groups differently. Now, I needed to bring this one in, and I see, I apologize, there's a slight typo on the ETA. It should be EDTA. It's the Educational Theater Association, and I want to talk to you specifically about the Texas chapter. And I want to mention this one because we are in a time of pandemic, and um, some of the stuff that's happening at the local level could be just game changers for the organization. What happened here is Hurricane Harvey came through, and this particular uh, chapter said, oh, my gosh, we've got to do something for these schools. So they created, through Google Doc, a way to match schools in need with schools that had stuff. And then they helped pull together and they engage their student population, pull together resources, um, dollars, and get them to the schools in need. Now, right after Hurricane Harvey, you remember we had a couple of other hurricanes come right on board. And one of the cool things is that this became, this global came in, their global research came in and said, let us help you learn from this and then take it to other associations, to California's for the fires, to Florida. And what happened was this incredible loyalty of the members, members helping members, but it began at the chapter level. Um, so I got to give you one last one because how could we not have a conversation and not mention pivoting? I know that we at the national level are doing amazing amounts of things to reach out to our members, right? There's, there's lots of different ways. One of the beautiful ways of making sure of, of of making sure that our members get a personal as well as a national touch is really enabling supporting our chapters in being able to pivot to do things that are unusual that can reach out and engage folks. I just wanted to share this to you because I think one of the very coolest things ADHA has just had a record recruitment a record recruitment because of all the COVID thing going on, and in part because their local chapters are creating these incredible touch points. This is from Colorado. They had an amazing turnout. They did a series of these. This one's Wellness and Keeping Our Calm, and they had a licensed professional counselor. They also had a yoga, ses yoga session. They have really said to their chapters, stay in touch. <clears throat> HSMA, as you can only imagine, sales, marketing, um, folks in the hospitality in, in are struggling, struggling, struggling. Same concept there. And one of the AGC <coughs> excuse me, chapters actually began sourcing PPE. So we can, by encouraging our chapters to pivot, we can find another channel to these organizations. All right. We've given you, <laughs> we've run through with lots and lots of different things. I'm just going to go through a couple of real quick tips on ways to support and then wrap us up. Please, if you've got questions, go ahead and, and share them. And if you don't get the question shared while we're here in these last couple of minutes, go ahead and reach out to us. But I think it's really important for us to share what we've learned in talking to these people about these stories. Create flexibility in your models and structures. Don't hold people to the same thing. Be sure to allow them to reach out and try new things. That's everything from being a local networking group instead of a chapter to how do I find the right, how do I find the right technology, how do I think about events differently. Track performance. If you track performance across your system, you can make better decisions, which lead you to allocating the dollars and resources that will make a difference. Train and support. Benchmarking study showed a really nice uptick in, in offering training and support, particularly virtual temps and tools and training. Go ahead, build those in. These are busy volunteers. They are not subject matter experts when it comes to um, association management, event management, to help them out. Invest in shared platforms. One of the best things you can do, and the organizations in our benchmarking who are doing this, 
um, just sing the praises, shared database, shared registration, the ability to actually give them the best technology and allow you to have the handshake and be able to track that engagement is absolutely critical. And finally, reward and recognize. And um, one of the cool things that we have in that benchmarking report, and I'll tell you to point to it, we have a gorgeous chart <laughs> of all the different ways to reward and recognize. But this comes to, and I'm going to steal Peter's words, it's aspirational versus prescription. It's inspiring them versus giving them a checklist. It's really about helping people see where I can be and then supporting them through one, two, three, and four to be the best that they can be. All right. I don't know what you're going to try to do tomorrow, but let me suggest to you that you can start by brainstorming ideas with your chapters. You can pilot an idea as opposed to going whole hog. You can tap chapters as, as uh, promotional, con promotional and content channels rather than trying to get them to do something different, just how do I push through um, some good information. You could repurpose and build on what you've already created and already worked on. So we have gone a great distance here. We've talked about what the benchmarking study has told us. We've talked about what a bunch of chapters, of chapter-based organizations have tried. Hopefully we've given you some ideas about turning ideas into actions. Um, what do you think, guys? What might you do tomorrow with ideas we explored today? And let's see if there's any questions before we do a wrap-up. So, and, hey, and while you're go ahead, Peter. While you're thinking of that, uh, I want to emphasize and, and sort of restate a, a critical point that Peggy made, and that's this notion of being flexible about what our chapters do. We want them to do the things that they want to do, because if we make them try to do things they don't want to do, I guarantee you they will fail. We will be disappointed. They will be disappointed. The members will be disappointed. We won't get anywhere. But if we build on the existing passion that resides at the local level and let them chase the things that make them excited, be aspirational and inspirational rather than prescriptive, I think we can get far more out of the chapters than uh, we ever have in the past. So I have a question for you guys. Um, mm -hmm. Terry here. I have the pleasure of having the open mic. Um, it looks like a couple will have to drop off and that's totally cool. If you have questions or as I'm chatting or we're closing, feel free to ask them there in the chat window, or you could reach out to, to Peggy or Peter. I know that they would be happy to have a conversation with you. Um, they are the chapter gurus. They are the father and mother of chapters in this industry. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say grandfather and grandmother yet. I'll give them a little bit more. Time Thank you. That, but <laughs> but um, so one of the questions I had was we kind of skimmed over it and you skimmed over it again at the end when you talked about tracking performance. Mm -hmm. um, so to kind of bring the whole thing full circle on what you just said, Peter was like, you know, don't hold them accountable to doing exactly what you want them to do. But then we also said track performance, right? And then you also mentioned, um, you know, tracking the ROI on the chapters. Can you give us a, just a, like a little bit of feedback on how do you even manage or track the ROI on chapters? It's specifically like dues related or per event related, or what does that look like? Is there a template for it? Or uh, well, uh, great question, uh, Terry. Um, I think uh, Peter, that, you're breaking up again, unfortunately. I'm breaking up again? Well, no, now you're good. Uh, and now I'm good? Okay. Uh, so there are actually some tools we have available on our website. I'd be happy to send it to anyone who would like to get a copy. It's, it's a, what I call an ROI matrix. And what it does is it looks all the, at all the things that a chapter might do, not all the things a chapter does, but all the things a chapter might do, and says, how do we monetize? How do we put a dollar value on those specific things? And it uses a series of different techniques. So we can, for example, look at the direct value of a chapter activity. Let's, as a simple example, let's say the chapter um, sells T-shirts with the association logo on, logo on it, and the National Association picks up a rebate on every T-shirt sold. So you've got a direct value uh, back from the chapter on that. That's a fairly simple metric to get your arms around. Then there's, there's we, can, we can monetize the 
service that they might be offering. So let's say the chapters are doing a, a PSA that's, that's driving the, whatever your industry conversation or industry mission is, uh, what would it cost you to do that versus having the chapter do that? You can monetize that. You can place a dollar value on it. There's also the indirect value, or you can, you can actually look at what's the value of the time that the volunteers are spending doing whatever it is they're doing. Uh, and and there, are, there are organizations that actually monetize that number. And then you can look at the indirect value. So if the chapter is doing X, Y, and Z, what kind of indirect changes are we seeing in our member retention? our member growth, any of those things you want to count. Mm -hmm. And once you count them, you can figure out how much they're actually worth. Retention can be monetized. And you take all that monetization and you cross foot and you, you get a number down in the lower right hand corner of a spreadsheet. And that's the number you want to be focused on. That's the number that justifies whatever you're putting into your P&L on the expense side. Uh, so that's a, that's a process that you can walk through. Um, happy to help you, but I mean, it's something that you can go to our website mm -hmm. and, and see the R ROI matrix there. That so, and is I'll, beautiful. Yeah. I was going to mention, I've just put up the three reading recommendations, and partially the reason why I did this is because, uh, first of all, we referenced the member engagement and loyalty survey, and I want you to see it, but we also wrote the white paper for um, the community brands on evaluating your um, association uh, chapter program, which has some ROI, and there is a link there as well. So there's, a, there's it's a very cool and exciting. I'm glad you asked the question. <laughs> Yeah, sure. I know it's taking us a little over time, but I feel like it's almost a, um, you know, a webinar all of its own, right? It sounds like. And why yes. am I not surprised that you have the resource at our fingertips? So good for you guys. Always thinking ahead. You are um, truly uh, integrated with what associations need with chapters. Did we have any other questions come in? I think we have answered. You guys did a great job answering questions and adding commentary along the way. And I think since we're um, over our, our 2 p.m. Central mm -hmm. Time, 3 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, time zone here, then I think we'll wrap up. Any last words, uh, Peter or Peggy? So I just would love to, to say that, you know, a couple of comments in the, in the chat were really cool because we, we go out there and we look for ideas, but when we can see somebody in the chat say, yeah, we've tried that and it does work. So I just want to just like, sometimes you get these ideas and you wonder like, can somebody else do it? But we had validation here on the chat as well as some folks saying there's some cool extra ideas. So uh, very cool to be able to talk with, with your folks on this. And thanks to everybody for participating. Glad you're here. Uh, Peggy and I realize that we only know what we know inside here, and that's not very much. And it's really the, what we know as a collective that creates the re real value for the association community. So thank you for participating today. And hopefully you'll share out what you think you learned today and, and, and help, help others enjoy uh, whatever value you got. Okay. Yeah. Such awesome insights. Thank you, Mariner Management, for being with us today, Peter and Peggy. For all your applicable, oh my gosh, I almost wish I had chapters for just a second, <laughs> applicable <laughs> insights today um, to all of our attendees. And for those of you that are still here, even past the hour, so glad you're here to take in all this good information about chapter engagement. And in light of today's topic on chapters, and honestly, in light of the times that we're in, I found wisdom in a high praised American poet, Maya Angelou. When you do nothing, you feel overwhelmed and powerless. But when you get involved, you feel the sense of hope and accomplishment that comes from knowing you are working to make things better. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks. Thank you. Namaste.